So uh, that was episode one of nine of The Exorcist. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We have uh, a lot of the cast, and we have Mr. Jeremy Slater here as well. So let's go ahead and welcome them up, and we'll go ahead and begin our Q&A. Please put your hands together for Jeremy. Hi. So exciting. And uh, we have Malza Makar is here. Sit wherever you please, sir. And we have uh, Hannah Kasalka is here. Brianne Howie, hi ladies, welcome. And uh, Gina is on her way. Um, so I think we should, we'll go ahead and get started and um, get your quest, keep be thinking about your questions. Um, okay, so guys, I uh, wanna start by asking kind of all of you, and Jeremy, maybe you can kick it off. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the novel of The Exorcist. I'm a huge fan of the movie. And uh, when I, I saw the TCA presentation this summer, I had only seen the pilot. And so it felt like, okay, there's, there's a loose connection here. Uh, and, and then in the mid-season, this huge reveal happened. And, and it was interesting for me as a fan, and I don't know if any of you felt this way, because I felt like this show was like, it's totally its own thing. And, and as a fan of all the original material, I was loving it that way too. So my question for you is when you were developing this and, and going out to the cast and to Gina uh, and, and you know getting this all together, was it always sort of structured that way? Did you always know that it was going to be a continuation of the story? And can you talk about the choice to sort of not really let the audience in on that in the beginning? Um, yeah, I, I, I knew three years ago th I, I figured out the, the Angela Reagan twist, um, but I, I guarded it very fiercely because, because I knew the development process. It was a long time for the cat to get out of the bag, and once that happened, the secret would be blown. And so even when we shot the pilot, I think the only four people who knew about it were myself, um, our showrunner, Rollin Jones, our director, Rupert Wyatt, and then Gina knew, because that's how we got her um, to, to take the part, is, is by promising her that this is more than just a Chris McNeil role. Like, you're not gonna just be sitting there for 10 episodes, looking worried, but getting like shoved out of the room and like sitting in your living room, like waiting for the two men to come in and kind of save the day. Um, so so we, we pitched her the entire arc. We pitched her, you know, you are Reagan, we're not gonna find that out until the midpoint. Um, and, and by the end of the season, the demon is gonna jump from your daughter into you, um, and you're gonna get to be a bad guy. And, and I think that was the big appeal for her because um, in, in, in her long and amazing career, she's never actually played a villain before. This is her, her first time at it. She's really fucking good at it. Um, <laughs> that was a huge part of, of the appeal for her. And the way we structured it, I, I, it was tough because if we had said right off the bat, like it's the continuing adventures of Reagan McNeil, we probably would have had a lot more people watching our pilot. We probably would have gotten a lot more buzz going in. Um, but at the same time, the show would have never been anything more than the continuing adventures of Reagan McNeil. So it was really important to me to have those first five episodes to fall in love with this family and, and with these characters and really care about Casey as a person, um, not as the daughter of Reagan, um, which would have, I, I think if we had come out and led with that, with that reveal in the beginning, it, it would have upset the balance of the entire series. So we really had to guard it. We had to lie to a lot of press for a long time and promise people and that moms. this was, and moms. <laughs> um, the, the people who knew and the people who found out really worked with us to help keep it a secret and, and, and make it a surprise for the fans. And for that, um, we are eternally grateful. And for all of our ladies on the panel, um, all of you relate to this uh, story in very different ways. Um, and so I would love to hear from you guys when you first knew what exactly this was and, and if there was any sort of, um, you know, personal connection, fandom, or did you sort of approach it completely clean? Like, yeah, I know what that is in this pop culture sort of world, literary world, cinematic world, but did you approach it sort of like, but you know, not with like that close of a connection to it? I had never seen the movie before doing the pilot. Boo. I know, boo, <laughs> I get eggs thrown at me immediately. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I'm very scared of scary things and scary movies and I was raised in Georgia in the Bible Belt and had the fear of God put in me from a kid. Um, so like I wasn't allowed to watch scary movies and, it, and that stuck with me. So as soon as I got the audition, I was like, eek, 
um, didn't want to go in. I, I tried to push it. I was like, can I just ride on? It's Friday. I don't want to be possessed by the devil today. <laughs> That's a lot. It's been a long week. Um, but yeah, but so I, I went into it kind of open. I knew it for obviously uh, as a title and from pop culture, but um, I, I did the pilot like a clean slate, mm -hmm. and and then I watched the movie after we shot the pilot, and yeah, that's sort of my experience with it. Brienne, before we hear your answer, may we say hello to Miss Gina Davis? Gina Davis, everyone. Oh, hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, daughters. Hi, everybody. Hi. 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 Did you like it? Did you like it? Was that cool? It's cool. So we were just talking about how everybody sort of came to learn about the reveal of the fact that this was Reagan, the continuing adventures of Reagan McNeil. Uh, so yeah, I, would you like to tell, I'd love to hear about that from you. Uh, oh, from, no. Oh, you, you go, I wanna, I wanna hear other people's Gina, stories. Gina, you go. No, I wanna hear about how you <laughs> learned. <laughs> I, Cause I can't remember how early you guys learned. We you didn't know right away, right? Hannah, Jeremy, and I actually went to dinner at yeah. this really, really yummy place in Chicago, and we were yeah. eating pie, and he just turned, and I don't know, I think it was must have been during the pilot, right? Yeah, we, it was like the, or last maybe it was the last day of the pilot. Yeah, it was, yeah, maybe towards the very, very end of the pilot, and he was like, you guys, I wanna share something with you. <laughs> Are you ready to get your minds blown? <laughs> we were like, what? Yeah, and then he told us, and we already knew that this was a really special project that was going to exceed everyone's expectations. And then the second he told us that, I, I, I was blown away and knew that this was going to be even more special than I could have imagined. And it has been. And Mausam, you know, your role is different, uh, but really, uh, really vital to this story because, uh, and so I'm not even going to say any more. I would like to hear about, about your experience sort of coming to this material and, and, and your take on it. Um, sure. Um, yeah, so I came in later. I started with episode two. So um, I remember getting the audition sides and immediately knowing that this was something special because the writing was so good. Uh, and I hadn't seen the movie at the time either. So uh, I got cast. I think I ended up shooting a couple of episodes. And I'm like, I, th I think I might be the only one who hasn't seen this. So I have to go home stat and watch this movie because I felt like a fraud like shooting this. Um, and I watched it. And I think I watched the movie. And then the next episode I was shooting was episode five, and I read the script, and I was like, no <laughs> way! So everything was very fresh in my head. So it was just, I mean, I just remember like getting to the end, I'm like, oh my god, I can't tell anybody this, what's going on? So it was pure excitement, and I love horror movies. So I loved the movie, and I loved being a part of the show, and that was just like the perfect reveal. And Gina, before you got here, uh, Jeremy was saying how how excited he was to see you play a villain uh, for a minute. And uh, I, we were talking earlier, and, and I told you that I felt like you looked like you're having a pretty good time up there. Uh, would I be right in assuming that? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it turns out it's fun to be possessed. <laughs> um, I uh, yeah, I when I because when I first. Uh, uh, Jeremy and everybody was first talking to me about playing this role. I found out that um, that was the idea that I was going to turn out to be uh, Reagan. And I was like, oh, I loved it so much. And I was so worried all the way until the fifth episode actually aired. I was so terrified that somebody might find out. I didn't even tell my husband. I told nobody. Um, because I couldn't wait for the surprise. And then I happened to be with Jeremy when people were watching it, and he was looking at the Twitter thing, and it was like, OMG, OMG, <laughs> WTF. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just people going crazy, like, what? So that was super fun. That's great. So now here we are, and uh, boy, we're in it. We're in it, and, and I, I have to say, when I saw, so when I saw episode eight, uh, and, and we learned that, that Angela is possessed and she kills Chris, I was like, oh my gosh. And knowing that there were only two episodes in the season left, I thought we were going straight into, I, you know, I thought we were going straight into like the power of Christ compels you for, for lack of a better way to explain it. But to see 
uh, Angela kind of play with this a little bit more. And, and we are learning um, so much about this. Like she has this line about, the, about integration and she invited me in. I, I just, I wanna know more about that. About integration or yeah. about? I, well, I, I want to know more about like, uh, the idea that the Pazuzu demon and Reagan have this bond and it's coming back into play. I mean, she talks about right. it, you know what I mean? And, like, and that seems new for me uh, as knowing the, the other material. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, uh, one, one of the new wrinkles to the mythology that we've added this season is the idea of integration, the idea that what, what a demonic possession is is the, is the demon invading this body and, and trying to submit the soul and force you to say yes. It's like a vampire where you have, to, you have to invite the vampire inside before he can come in and eat you. And that's kind of what integration is. You have to say yes, and, and, and at that point, um, the demon comes in and there's a union of, 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 of soul and demon. Um, and the possession is permanent. She's not lying about that. There's no going back once you're integrated. So that's why when you see kind of the cult of angels in episode six and they're doing their, their, their summoning ceremony and, and, and Superintendent Jaffe kind of says, take me and invites the demon in, there's no possession. He skips right past the, the eight hours of shit that Casey went through. Well, that's why um, Casey looked so bad too. Yeah, because she's fighting. I didn't get a lot of sleep when we were shooting. <laughs> Um, yeah, because she's fighting it. So because she, because thing, Casey, yeah. the real Casey who's still in there, is, is saying no. She's refusing to submit. Um, and, and so what we call demonic possession is, is sort of the physical manifestations of that battle that's taking place inside the body. Um, and, and, but once you say yes, once you invite it in, then, then there's really no difference between host and demon anymore. You just kind of become one. Um, so, so Angela's gone. Um, she's she's a bad guy now, um, and 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 yeah, she has she has jumped to the other side, and so she still kind of retains the memory and some of the personality of the original host. Um, but but it really is a fusion of that with Pazuzu, with this demonic entity. So there's not really a delineation anymore between Angela and Pazuzu. It's just just bad Angela. Yikes. Uh, so I, I know that you guys, this is, this is for you guys, this is a fan thing, and I've been fanning out for the last 15 minutes, so let's give it to you guys. Uh, do we have any questions in the audience? One right here, yes, and I'll repeat it back. Yeah, so how do you guys approach your characters, uh, you know, when, when you're getting into a horror project? I think you kind of take it scene by scene. Every, every episode is very different, and every scene is very different, and I think each character is in a different place at each scene. And I think it was almost even harder tracking, because you don't always shoot in order, tracking where we were at at each point, being like, oh, wait, we actually we don't know this part yet, or uh, my character hasn't, hasn't uh, made that, that journey yet from A to B. I sort of always feel like uh, the genre will sell depending on uh, if you if you believe in it. Uh, like um, when I was making Stuart Little, I remember the director said uh, before we started, people will believe in Stuart if you do. And you have to make sure that you believe that he's real. And, and so I think that's what sells the horror too to audiences is if the, the characters really take it seriously and believe it. Uh, and comedy's funnier if, if the people are actually suffering or going through whatever it is um, uh, they're going through, if, if, it, if it's real, if you, if you buy that that's really happening to somebody. So we, that's, that's kind of our job, is to sell to you that this is actually happening to us. The writing was so good and the characters stood alone without horror. I mean, we could have made this as an hour long family drama uh, without the devil, <laughs> you know what I mean? Without those aspects of like, the writing was really good, so it gave all the actors, I think, like something to really latch on to, and it was super grounded and in a real place, and then once you're there, it's just, yeah, buying, buying the given circumstances, so. We're basically This Is Us, except every now and then someone yeah, has a centipede. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> like, this is Same us. show, though, same, same show. Same show. We should have had a Thanksgiving episode. <laughs> yeah. There was, a, there was a turkey in that one. We did. This kind of was yeah. the Thanksgiving episode. We had gravy and everything. <laughs> and those mashed potatoes were so good. <laughs> good. <laughs> I, I couldn't eat in the scene, which I was kind of mad about. 
So I ate between takes just shoveled mashed potatoes in. Well, and, and I was in a love story, so I, I don't even know anything about the horror. I just don't understand why Tomas is not talking to me. So, <laughs> but I, I, I was like, just tell me, me just tell me what's going on at work. <laughs> just talk to me. Dude, so I don't know what's more horrific than ghosting. Seriously, oh Tomas is like all about that ghosting. It's not cool. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, does anyone else have a question? Yes. So Maddie's question was essentially, you know, let's say this wasn't, there wasn't the supernatural element, essentially. What is the most uh, compelling or, or powerful part of your character to you? Well, what drew me to Casey, um, I like, well, I felt that she was super empathetic, that she sort of took on everyone's problems. Like, she took on Kat's burdens and her dad's burdens and her mom's burdens, and that sort of... I think eventually that's what led her to be susceptible to being possessed because her spirit was sort of broken and she had kind of just taken on too much, um, too much more than she could handle. So, but yeah, that's I, I liked that she was just um, really empathetic. And then over th the course of the series, like super strong um, and, a f and a fighter. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I think I was really drawn. I remember when I first got the audition, and I wasn't, I didn't know what to expect, and then I read the sides, um, and it was our scene together in the pilot that with the, the tickle monster and cats being super emo on, on her window. That um, was supposed to be like a wrestle, too. It was. Yeah, actually. You guys like totally oh, a shook headlock, it out. A headlock. Yeah, yeah. And I was and like, Ooh. And you said, like, ultimate headlock or something. Yeah, like I was I supposed was like to end up on the floor in a headlock, and we were like, maybe we'll do something else. <laughs> Who wrote this shit? <laughs> The family bond was really stood out to me, and I guess I, I I read the script and was like, this this stands alone without the possessions, without the horror aspect. It stands alone as a really really compelling, honest slice of life of what this family is going through and how they grieve. And I thought that that was so interesting and and um, unique, especially with so many female characters. So yes, I mean, how could you say no? Yeah. And Brianne, I'd love to ask you just a quick follow-up on that because, um, you know, we learned a lot about your character earlier in this season, and there was some real stuff going on with her. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed that part as well. Um, it was, because it was exactly what you're talking about. It's the real life, the real horrors of losing someone you're in love with and uh, admitting who you are to your family and maybe having to give up on a dream and all of those things. Um, you know, that, that also must have been kind of fun, or not fun, but you know, I interesting. Yeah, fun hard. Yeah. Fun hard, exactly. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good fun hard. Yeah, I mean, I was blown away. I hadn't, you don't come across a lot of female characters like that that get to who aren't perfect, and it's not about the way they look, and it's about how they feel and how and how they're dealing with real life, and that's what Jeremy did such a good job with, along with He's plenty great. of other wonderful writers He's we have. <laughs> He's paying us. <laughs> to <say this>. Totally <laughs> paying. <laughs> no, yeah, I was excited to be like, oh my gosh, uh, I get to have like not. Pretty makeup. I mean, the being in the hair. I was. That's the longest I've ever been in hair and makeup to look that good, guys. <laughs> um, and that was super exciting because as a blonde young woman in Hollywood, that doesn't happen. So, yeah, thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> and you're welcome, uh, Malzum. I, I I feel like in a lot of ways your arc, uh, your character's arc with with Father Tomas is is almost <laughs> just as tragic if that makes sense, because I think that we as the audience can really see that, that you guys, your characters love each other, and um, but it just can never be. I mean, that's, that sucks. <laughs> no, it's, it's very, I mean, and that's, you know, and kind of tying back to your earlier question, I think that's what I loved about Jessica so much is because she is, she's a woman in love, and, you know, in her mind, you know, Tomas can serve God and still be with her. Like, it's not you have to choose. I mean, clearly that's not where Tomas is, but I think I just loved the fact that she was that she was in love and she was going to fight for it. And I just loved that hope and that optimism and no matter what's going on in her life, it's like, come on, we're supposed to be together. Just, pull it, just you know, so I, j I, I loved the, the pain that she was feeling. I mean, not, not loved it, but I could... I could understand it, so and that's what really drew me to it. But yeah, it, it is tragic, but it was fun hard. It was fun hard. <laughs> it's no better way to describe it. And Gina, how about you? For for Angela, you know, aside from, I mean, obviously the. 
the supernatural element is such a big part of her character for her whole life, and she's been living with it for her whole life, but aside from the supernatural element, is there a part of her that you love the most? Uh, I, I loved how uh, competent she was in so many different ways. Uh, you know, she not only had a job with uh, 700 employees, but uh, you know, she's got a husband with traumatic brain injury and a daughter with this horrific uh, incident that happened to her, and and uh, you know, just okay. Now I'll handle that. Now I'll handle that. And I, I, I thought that was uh, uh, a great way to set up the character because then how could we give her too much to possibly handle? And, uh, and we did. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was great. I mean, there's nothing more fun than uh, having an arc to your character and having them change as it goes along and uh, to sort of come out as a completely other person halfway through and, uh, and, and, and then get possessed. I mean, it's just like uh, super fun. Uh, uh, other than driving off a cliff, I think it's probably the most fun <laughs> I've, <laughs> most <laughs> biggest arc and most fun that I've had. <laughs> hashtag renew the exorcist. Are you guys familiar with there that hashtag? Go. I thought so. Um, yeah, it's a big question. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, we, we, we've always promised that this first season um, would have a beginning, a middle, and an end. That we were going to tell the story of the Rance family possession and that we weren't going to drag it out because, because we're not going to get to the end and then be like, hey, come back next year and find out who gets hit with the baseball bat. Um, we're, <laughs> we're not going to cheat you. Um, and, and, and it would also be a cheat to just have the demon play musical chairs for the entire series, to be like, oh, season two, now it's in Cat, and like, come back for season three for demonic Alan Ruck. Um, <laughs> th there's I a certain- watch that. Yeah, I, I want to see that I would watch too, that too, actually. but, but <laughs> there's a certain point, probably midway through episode 10, where you're like, how much more shit can they put this poor family through? How much more pain and suffering? Um, spoiler. Uh, so, so, we have to we have to wrap up this season and give it a satisfying ending. And and what I've always said is that the characters who survive and have um, and still have story left to tell, you will see them again in the future in some capacity. But I think the way this show moves forward and lives and breathes is that every season you have to give the audience a reason to care. And, and in the first season, that reason was the Rance family. That they are the emotional spine of the show. They are why you care. They are what you are, are emotionally invested in. And for season two, we have to discover what that is. Well, and you guys have set up this bigger world. I mean, we know about the, I mean, I don't know if corruption is the right word, but the goings on inside the higher, higher ups in the Catholic Church. Um, my question for you is, if we were to get a season two, in your mind, do you see it as like an almost anthology or do you see it as a continuation of the foundation that we've built here? It's definitely not an anthology in the sense that it's, it's not American Horror Story where every year you would get a brand new set of characters. Um, you would definitely, like, let's, let's say Father Tomas and Marcus survive this season, which is not a promise, um, but, but if they survived, you would see them again in season two. We're not going to hit the reset button there. Um, and, and the same thing goes with this larger conspiracy, with, with the, the sort of the firstborn and the cult of angels. Um, the invasion has already happened. They, the, our enemies are all around us. It kind of happened when no one was looking. Um, and, and, and that's another change that we've made from the original source material, where you know the first film treated uh, demonic possession kind of like a lightning strike, like this one in a million event. And we're saying it's not a one in a million. We're lightning bolts are hitting the ground all around us all the time. These things are here, they have a plan, they're working towards something. Um, and, and, and part of the fun moving forward is, is finding out what that plan is. And knowing that our heroes are the only ones in the world who kind of are aware that there's this larger conspiracy. I Just as a quick uh, side note, but I it's not related to that, but I have to bring it up. The um, Captain Howdy, uh, the, the salesman, is that, you guys refer to him as the salesman, but uh, you know, I certainly was like, it's Captain Howdy. Uh, and um, he is so good. Like he's awesome. And, and I love seeing him. And recreating those scenes from the original and seeing Gina and them or seeing his interaction with the girls, like that is so, is it as fun to watch or write and perform as it is to watch? Because I think he's amazing. 
He's great. This is a Hannah question because Hannah has had to portray him a lot of the time. Yeah, um, we got very close. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tell us more. <laughs> I'm blushing. Uh, yeah, Robert's Robert Louis is amazing. Like, he is a really incredible actor. He's just like a true like artist. Like, he's doing like Tai Chi before. It makes me feel. Like I don't know what I'm doing. Wait, I mean, what? I Wait, there's Tai Chi. Yeah, he does Tai Chi before he. Like on set. Yeah, like b to get in character right or something. He's I don't know. summoning the demons. That's and what I'm saying. Like, like this is the kind of stuff that like I'm not like that. Like I'm I'm very like I don't know. He's he's just like a true like artist and like really sweet guy and um yeah. And I had to kind of I s sort of like studied what he did because I wanted to like mirror his body language when uh, when Casey was him um, so yeah it was cool it was like, nice to have someone that was g good and and really giving and generous and also nice and not a jerk between takes even though I hated him in the mm -hmm. scene I mean when it was just when it was like Casey versus him um, he's really good as an actor too so it was nice to like be able to turn it on and off yeah and you will see the salesman again in episode 10 and he's by far the scariest oh. he has been all season He's awful. It's awful. I am so excited. <laughs> um, we have a really smart, really talented writers room. Um, it's 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 not me. It's it's about twelve people, some of whom are in the room right now. Brian Russell back there. Franklin Rowe, oh who co-wrote this episode. Um, are there any other writers here? Who? Adam Stein's here. Where's where's Stein? Oh. oh. <laughs> and Martina's back there. And M is oh. back there. So, so we have a, a, an amazing, we had the best writer's room in the business. We started, um, we started our, we were late like a month and a half uh, starting this show because we refused to hire anything but the best writers. And it fucked us production wise for the rest of the year. <laughs> um, but it was worth it because we had really, really smart, passionate people who cared a lot. And, and so I can't take the credit for any of that. Um. What was your I'm sorry. What what was it like getting in the headspace of playing possessed? And there's a physicality to it as well. Yeah, I uh we joked about like it was like P90 exorcist. Like I was sore <laughs> all the time. Like uh it was a really <laughs> hard like workout. Um um yeah, so that the physicality was a part of it. Like I grew up um dancing so I I think that kind of helped um, weirdly like um, I was just trying stuff um, I didn't really in terms of physicality until like we got to 106 our director Tinge um, Jennifer no wait who what did Tinge was Tinge seven, seven sorry Oof. was uh, she brought um, some like videos of meth heads like meth addicts mm. to me to to watch which was really cool because I was like I'm running out of ideas here <laughs> like I don't know what else I can do I can only thrash and whatever so much so so that was cool um, to like fight the demon and like be scratchy and um, twitchy and and bring that kind of element to it so but also very sore like I, and I think I punched uh, Ben in, in the car when they were like uh, were driving me because <laughs> I was just thrashing and being crazy and I hit him a couple of times. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was like, it was physically taxing, but in, in terms of like going to a, a place, I um, I tried to just treat it like I would any other character. Like, what is this? What do I want? Like, what's my objective? What am I trying to get? And then try to get it from my scene partner. And I had the best scene partners. So um, yeah, so it made it made my job easy, and the writing was so good, and the makeup and the vo everything like bring you know adds to it the environment and yeah. So favorite episode this season? Good question, really good one. You'll see it next week. Ten. <laughs> yeah, ten. Uh, ten. <laughs> I like three for me, three and five, um, for me because three was fun because I got to play Casey and the demon do the fun stuff. Like some good smooching. And I got a good oh. smooch. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was my first on-screen kiss. And you're never going to top it. <laughs> no. Gina's was All Brad downhill. Pitt. Gina's first on-screen kiss was Brad Pitt, right? And <laughs> 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 yeah. 
everybody else, what are we thinking about our favorite episodes? Is it all episode 10 for you guys? Um, episode 5 for me because I had because I had a chance to be a part of the exorcism world, you know, to be to be possessed by the devil. So that was that was a blast for me. I, I think I, I haven't seen 10 yet, obviously, but I think three for me also because you learn the most about Kat and that was just a crazy episode. Well, guys, I can't thank you all enough for being here. Um, you know, the show is incredible. I know we're all on pins and needles. I can't believe it's still one week away, but ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the team behind The Exorcist. And, and can I just say, guys, um, thank you for all your passion. We have the best fans in the world. If we all the Renew the Exorcist, the Exorcist congregation out there. Um, if we get a second season, it's because of you guys. You have made a lot of noise online. Fox is listening. They're very aware of, of how passionate you guys are and how much you love the show. Um, and we can't thank you enough. Um, you make this all so worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, my name is Clark Wolf. I do Collider Nightmares every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on Collider Video. Please subscribe. Please watch us. We love The Exorcist. We love scary things. And uh, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.